Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to another episode of Voices for Excellence. I am your host, Dr. Michael Connor, CEO and founder of the Agile Evolutionary Group and host for VFV. And today's guest, but very proud to have Tom Vanderark on our show. Yes, everybody, Tom cleared the schedule to join VFV. I feel important now. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to be with you. <laughs> Good to see you. But Tom, I got listen, to have Tom Vander Ark on VFV, this is a mic drop for me because hey, I just want to just give you a little context of Tom. Uh Tom is the former executive director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, was also an education advisor to uh, former Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan and President Barack Obama. He also is a, was a former superintendent. He has served on many national and international boards. And currently, he is the CEO and founder of Getting Smart. And, and listen, I was just talking to Tom a few minutes ago. I have the honor of being one of Tom's uh, fa uh, Pathway Fellows for Getting Smart. So the blogs that you see me uh, generating and producing and being uh, uh, um, uh, produced and, and, and highlighted and marketed by the Getting Smart team. This is all because of Tom's work and what he has done across the country, speaking of pathways and disruption. Uh, and, you know, I, I we, Tom and I were uh, talking just a few minutes ago, and I was like, Tom, you know, Barack Obama and Artie Duncan did invite me to speak to Congress about the small school redesign. Um, that we have uh, referenced in various education circles across the country. Uh, when we talk about the small school movement that we saw in education and continue to see elements of that, uh, we have, yes, the architect. I'm, and, and I will, uh, from an empirical sense, Tom, from a research sense, I would say you are the architect of the small school movement. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Tom Vander Ark to Voices for Excellence. Tom, my friend. You've been traveling, but how are you? <laughs> I'm good, Michael. It's really good to see you, man. That is so good to see you. I, you know, because of COVID, the last time Tom and I saw each other, I think this was after COVID. Um, I was on. I, I was very. Uh, um, I was highly honored to be selected to be on Tom's uh, panel with Ann Levette, uh, superintendent of uh, Savannah, and I was in my uh, previous role as superintendent, and Tom moderated a session. And I remember t Ann and I, this is the last time Tom and I saw each other. And at the end of the session, I was joking with Tom, you know, Ann and I are ready to meet, you know, the audience, the participants in the panel. It's kind of like Ann and I got pushed to the side and everybody was running up to Tom. Tom was taking pictures, signing autographs. I'm like, come on, man. I mean, you, you and Ann, you and Ann let that session up, Michael. Come on, you brought, you brought the juice to that session. You know how analytical I am, Tom. The data suggests otherwise, but glad to have you on, Tom. I we, to see you we, soon. And you know what that followed? Because you and Ann and I were all on the Learning 2025 Commission for Absolutely. AASA, and that was really good work. I super appreciate the the thoughtfulness that, and and sometimes the uh, the provoking uh, that you and Ann did. It was. Um, it was really valuable for uh, for that group. So I, I love your contribution to that group and learned a lot from you. And it's been been fun to work together in a in a variety of ways since then. Yeah, yeah. And Tom, just by you saying that, um, the podcast is going to stop because you know I'm just you know I'm getting the compliments from Tom Van der Ark. It stops. But yes, Tom, that and that's where you know uh, to my audience, that's where Tom and I first. Uh, met each other, uh, I was happened or I was uh, lucky to be selected as an honored as well to be one of the 33 uh, education leaders across the country coming from various uh, industries and even uh, different disciplines within the ecosystem uh, to develop the Learning 2025 National Report. And Tom and I worked in several small groups to work on specific components of that report that was disseminated to the Biden administration and USDE, and then also in a very broad sense. And that, and from there, that's where Tom and I uh, stayed together, stayed connected, and like I said, right now serving as one of his pathway uh, fellows has just been an absolute honor. It has been fun to really uh, write about topics that you know Tom has 
grounded in his research and even when he served as superintendent, executive director and advisor and to be able to, um, to bring this in a broader scale, it's just been an absolute honor. So Tom, good to have you here, but I, I want to, I want to hear what your, your, your equity song is. And this is the first question, right? Because this is interesting. I, now I never would, I, I can't wait to hear what your response is because I know that nobody has ever asked you this, but I, I can't wait to hear what this song is because you served in a myriad of different roles, whether it be the executive director for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, superintendent, international domestic boards, advising President Obama and uh, 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 Secretary uh, uh, Duncan. But what song defines Tom Vander Ark as a change agent, moreover, as an equity warrior for innovation at AC Stage of Education? All right, Michael, I have to bring you all the way back to 1973. <laughs> I figured it was gonna be. A, I figured it was gonna be a classic, Tom. Glad, Gladys Knight, Michael. All I wanted in life was to be a pip. I wanted to be Gladys Knight's backup. And my favorite, my favorite song from that Imagination album was "I've Got to Use My Imagination." There you go. Now there, there's a couple of reasons. One is because the pips just lit it up in that one. They they, they had these. Just beautiful tuxedos with the ruffly shirts and right doo, doo. yeah and the, you i and so i would be in my basement i'm like i'm in i'm a sixth grader uh -huh. and i would be practicing the pip routines to gladys knight i love it but what i love about that song is like i've got to use my imagination i've got to keep on keeping on mm -hmm. and i have to make the best of a bad situation <laughs> so it's all in there. It's all in there. It's about making the best of the bad, about per, uh, perseverance, about imagination and innovation. So it's Gladys Knight. Hey, listen, Tom, of course you have a correlation of education, creativity, and innovation with Gladys Knight in the fifth. Yes, Tom, I love it. I love it. But it's so true, right? Because... Yeah. When we think about reimagination, when we think about transformation in the serial disruptive or radical sense, we have to be able to use our imagination to be able to keep on keeping on and pushing through, especially now in this, I like to say this needed time of uh, education transformation, specifically when we look at the demographic breakdown and the segregation of Generation Z who is going to dominate the pre-K-12 sector in roughly two years where most of Generation Alpha will be um, middle school students and lower. So we have to keep on keeping on and interrogating these education structures and using imagination with it. But Tom, you you had me glad as night. You said you were practicing on that. that I, I got to see that. I hope somebody got me. Watch, watch the video. The the pips light it up in that one. I'm telling you. Tom, can I can I listen? I, I'm scheduled to come out to um to wash upstate Washington to come visit you for the Pathway Fellows convene. If I play that, can we get you up there? Can you can, can you promise on I, me? Oh, oh, only if you do. Again? Only if you do it with me. Yes. <laughs> right. Oh man, I love it, Tom. So. To continue on, that's why we got. I can't wait to catch up with you, right? But to to make sure the interview keeps going because we could just stay, just talk forever. But you served in many roles in the education space, but I want to capture your role as an advisor for Henry Duncan and uh, President Obama during the race to the top federal policy implementation, right? And I remember the testimony in in uh, that you gave regarding the small school model. And which, to be honest with you, Tom, I try to emulate that uh, and and not in, uh, I would say, in a comprehensive way of how you brought the small school structure, but different elements aligned to the context of, of where I was, specifically when I was a chief academic officer, trying to outline that process in the middle school redesign, right? This was in the BC stage of education. But now when I think of the AC stage of education, the steering concept can be disrupted with innovation, creativity, right? Uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, coupling the redesign of the structures and systems of the industrial model. But what would you have done differently knowing your knowledge now based on after COVID regarding 
innovative small school models in the AC stage of education. So I, I want to go back even before um, race to the top, and um, so this is 20, 23 years ago, um, and I would just want to lay out this this paradox of the work that I was leading then. On on one hand, I was discovering and supporting all the best progressive school networks in the country. Uh, I Tech High was just getting off the ground. Uh, they launched Expeditionary Learning. Mm -hmm. big, big picture, I visited the first MET school in uh, 1999. Um, the, the small schools work accelerated in New York City with, uh, with, with Julia Richmond, and then they opened um, Expeditionary Learning Schools and launched Urban Assembly, uh, New Tech Network got off the ground. And so around the country, we were, as, as Doc and Elliot at Big Picture taught us, rigor, relevance, and relationship. We were learning the, the formula uh, to really come alongside young people, particularly those historically marginalized, and, and give the, them a gift of um, places that, that valued uh, belonging and respect and gave students voice and choice uh, coherence and support. Um, and on, on the other uh, hand, I was um, trying to fight the, the fight with the equity warriors with Katie Haycock and trying to bring measurement to education to uncover the historic inequities in our system. Uh, and so I, I made a lot of grants that funded what became NCLB. Yeah. And it, it at the time, in 2020, it felt like a great bipartisan victory when governors and corporate leaders and uh, and the, the vast majority of senators um, came together and, and, and built a framework uh, for school improvement to try to ensure that every student in America would have access to, uh, to, to very good schools. And it felt like those ideas of, of measurement and progressive education uh, could come together. Um, and we know how that worked out, Michael. It, um, you know, the, the testing regime uh, sort of swamped uh, much of progressive education um, and, be and quickly became quite reductive um, and hasn't been very successful um, from an equity standpoint. So, so, you know, even in the narrowest sense of attempting to raise reading and math levels among historically underserved students hasn't been that successful and it um, was a huge damper to innovation in our system and I, ironically this damper was sort of placed on the system at the same time that we were beginning to incorporate technology into the system and so on, on one hand we were beginning to imagine a brand new set of possibilities of blended learning and online learning and uh, separating time and place from learning and just unlocking a new level of opportunity for young people. And on, on the other hand, in well-intentioned ways, we, we placed a big heavy blanket on the system uh, of, of standardized assessment. And um, so, you know, in retrospect, the older you get, the more you think about unintended consequences. And, and in retrospect, I wish we had done that differently and better, uh, more thoughtfully. I, I still believe measurement is, um, is powerful, but we, we obviously erected a system uh, that has really gone amok. I can blame Congress to a great extent for not iterating on the platform that was NCLB uh, 
uh, because they think it could have been salvaged and turned it into a, a positive improvement engine. Yeah. Um, but that never happened, and um, and 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 I think much of the systems improvement work of, of the last twenty years was really squandered, and it. I, I think the most important things that came from the last 20 years were new school development and the development of networks of new schools, both some managed, but many voluntary. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so a, a big damper on, on that as an improvement lever. Yeah. And, and Tom, I just, and I have two pretty uh, kind of sub questions, right? And, and I know that a lot of my uh, viewers, you know, when policy is being developed at the federal level, um, when we're looking at um, different policy levers to be able to eradicate specific gaps uh, within the education ecosystem, one of my questions, and I know that this was uh, a persistent question that, um, you know, I was asked and also I was asking during the implementation of NCLB was that the focus on standardized testing and the testing regime, A, was that the intent or was the intent truly to be iterative within the policy to use different measurement systems to be able to create equity in our schools? I, I think the intent at the core was informed improvement, mm -hmm. I think we were saddled with, you know, lousy World War II era psychometrics <laughs> that we still haven't, um, you know, adequately improved. And so I, I think it was really a, a misuse of outdated assessment practices um, because they were cheap and available. Okay. And then now, and just kind of underscoring that, <clears throat> I know you were intimately devolved with the uh, development of Race to the Top and implementation. Again, it kind of uh, seamlessly aligned to the last question, implementation with Race to the Top. And if there were, if you had to go back now to take a look at it, what would be some of the systemic and systematic changes you would make with the policy language and implementation? Uh, there's there's probably a boring book length um, evaluation <laughs> study to answer that question. Um, so I you know what what was different about Race to the Top and then subsequently I the I three grants the innovation grants mm -hmm. uh, was that they were invitational, so that they were different in nature than NCLB, which was sort of a blanket policy. This instead was was invitational. Um, in nature, and as a result, um, I think it did a, a better job of encouraging people with a, a vision of what to do next. Yeah. Um, but Michael, th this brings up the tension between innovation and equity that's gonna be central to our dialogue. Um, it did support good work in places where there was a history of good work where there was stable and effective leadership. Uh, th those things are most difficult to stand up in, in historically underserved areas. And, and so while a lot of good work was done under Race to the Top and then I-3 thereafter, um, it, I don't think it reduced inequity. You, you, you may even argue that it, that it increased inequity because of the the invitational nature of the grant system. Yeah, yeah. And you know what, and Noah, Tom, um, you know, I, I can say this, you know, you having your hands in both, um, really appreciative, you know, when we think about it, right, the initial constructs and the frames of NCLB, I it, it, historically, one thing that we can't deny when it was signed, when it was enacted by George Bush, um, that was probably the greatest bipartisan education policy in the history. Of no, no question of it, Michael. No question. And, 
at the time it was a real triumph and absolutely and and all of us knew there were a number of shortcomings well here i'll give you an example michael we we wrestled with the idea of, of growth and proficiency yeah. right we knew both of those were important we wanted to lock in on both of those we just didn't have good growth measures at the time and so we locked in on proficiency which meant that we were buying you know these world war ii psychometrics and we we just never added that counterweight of growth right and so the law that's one of the ways that the original vision was quite good and bipartisan uh, but its implementation because of expediency and expense um I, I think we we did things that that quickly left that that vision behind yeah unbelievable to have uh just to hear your intel with regards to um two large-scale federal policies macro level policies <clears throat> that you know uh, i implemented many educators that are um audience members of vfv have implemented as well and to have the context of thinking and the rationalization of both NCLB and Race to the Top is something I'm appreciative. But moving into your books that you have authored, as well as you have wrote a myriad of contributing, uh, or you have contributed to a myriad of different white papers, Tom. Uh, I can name about four, five, six in your book that I have read in and out to incorporate into my um, turnaround practices and transformational practices when I was both a CAO and superintendent. But I want to get back to your book of difference making at the heart of learning, right? Where Now, what are some of the core principles of this book, right, that you can at a high level unwrap for the AC, AC stage of education? And second, you know, because I'm a pathway fellow for you and for getting smart, how can I use the power of place, authentic learning through place-based education in my strategy regarding high school transformation? So. Speaking to superintendents, CAOs, and even high school principals that are trying to embark on this redesign, how can we use both of the texts that you wrote to be able to support that? Well, Michael, the um, so, so the the answer to to difference making is um, is really quite simple, at, at least conceptually. It's really about inviting learners into work that matters. It's creating space and time, at least periodically, to invite learners to find, to co-author, as, as we described it with our friends at AASA, to yeah. co-author learning experiences that are important to them and important to their community. So I think of that as work that matters. And it doesn't have to be every day or every month, but Boy, a few times a year, we we need to make that invitation to invite learners into um, opportunity recognition, yeah. or it's a problem finding. Mm -hmm. This is the heart of entrepreneurial mindset, and I now think it's probably the most important skill set going forward. It doesn't show up on very many people's portrait of a graduate, but you know, you've talked a couple of times about the the rise of AI. And what we can see is that we're see, we're seeing step function changes in machine capabilities and they're coming very very quickly. What that says to me is maybe more than anything we need to help young people develop an entrepreneurial mindset. And that starts with recognizing an opportunity, finding a problem that's worth solving, a problem that's important to you, given your strengths and your interests and your values, and a problem that's important to your community. So that's a new challenge that we, we have, particularly at the secondary level, that we need to find space and time to invite kids to do work that matters. Why is that? A couple of reasons. One, it's just super motivating. It's super engaging. Uh, we, we have a big engagement problem in America. I think we have a big engagement problem across the world, but but particularly in, in America. And work that matters is super motivating. It's super engaging. 
And the second reason is that it is a shortcut to some of the most important skills. Uh, I talked about problem finding. Uh, it's also complex problem solving. Uh, and it's learning to deliver impact to a community. So it's really focused on a, on a public product. So mm -hmm. problem finding, problem solving, impact delivering, um, all of that develops a sense of agency in a way that I don't think you can any other way. And by, by agency, it's, it's the self-knowledge of, I understand my strengths and interests, I understand the needs in the world, and I have the confidence to know where and how to act on the world. And I've come to believe that that, with this idea of opportunity spotting, might be the most important skills and, and mindsets that we can develop. And it may not be the only way that we get there. There's maybe other forms of, of inquiry-based learning, some forms of of project-based learning, maybe some new simulations. Uh, but I, I just find that difference-making is a, a shortcut to really valuable uh, skills. And it has this side benefit of just being super motivating for young people. Yeah. And, oh, and, and on the part of place, um, place is just a an amazing asset that you can leverage in doing that. And every place is a place. Every Every place has something to offer, and it's as simple as opening your door and inviting kids to discover their place. Um, I think place can and should be an important part of identity development for every young person, that they should have a chance to come to value the place that they're from, the people that live in the place that they're from. I think this is particularly important in rural schools because um, there's a, a beauty and a, a wonder in rural places that I, I'd love to see kids invited into. Um, I think you have a better chance of having kids stay at home and, you know, come back home if if they are invited to recognize the, the beauty, the wonder, um, the enterprise that's inherent in their local place. Yeah. And, and Tom, I really appreciate your answer because everything that you described, I always... <clears throat> You know, I, I, I haven't correlated it yet because I know I have some uh, psychometricians and statisticians and data scientists that watch this, but from a causality standpoint with regards to student agency and equity, there is a causal impact, causal implications between two because when you start giving students voice and agency within the teacher and learning organization to be a part of the design and the transformation, and then coupling that with value in place and home where they're from, that's equity. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, where a lot of people misconstrue what equity and excellence look like. But I really appreciate that. And when you talk about entrepreneurial mindset, right, and the example and how it's not, I was not embedded in the traditional industrial model. My eight-year-old son, I literally asked him and Tom, I am not lying to you. I'm like, Mikey. What, what 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 you like to do? What do, what do you what do you want to be? What what's going on, right? I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm like, wait wait, hold on. You're eight years old. What do you, what do you know about that, right? Huh. The context he provided, or the answer he he stated, I want to be able to create something, and I want to make a lot of money, and not work for my and not work for anybody. You're eight, dude. You're eight. How are you talking like that? But if you think about it, that's Generation Alpha, right, Tony? It, it it totally is. Um. Uh, a, a new study that uh, our friends at ASA just released um, showed that about half of Gen Z has entrepreneurial aspirations. Um, that's that's a huge increase from uh, pre-pandemic. I think it's in part because um, we saw record levels of business starts during the pandemic, uh, and a lot of parents just out of necessity, they lost their job, and so they started a, a, a business. Um, but yeah. I also think what's happened in the last 10 years, particularly the last five years, you could argue in the last five months, that the barriers have come down. Yes. The barriers of entry, the barriers to publishing, the barriers to starting a business, the barriers to gig work, 
right? It's just much easier to step into, to write a book and to publish it, to uh, create a podcast and share it, to create visual images, to stand up a Spotify store yeah. and to have uh, gig work as a, as a side hustle uh, to your, your job. And, and so the barriers to entrepreneurship have come down. Young people have seen people around them that look like them entering entrepreneurship. Um, we've seen this whole phenomenon of social media influencers, right? That's a whole new generation of, of entrepreneurship. But the, the challenge I see, Michael, is that 99% of career education that's happening in America today is about getting a job. Right. And we almost never invite young people to think about making a job. Oh, and I, yeah. so I think the new challenge is, is, is to create, starting in elementary school, create these spirals of possible futures and give his breadth of exposure to what's possible. And in, in every sector, as they look, you, you could say, here's how you get a job. Here's how you'd make a job. So that, that's a new challenge to expose all kids to the potential of entrepreneurship. Absolutely. Tom, thank you for that. And that is, um, I think, the continued process, right? You yeah to this with students and, but and i want i want to add when i say entrepreneurship i'm talking not just starting a business but i'm talking about social uh, impact as well because i think about these things synthetically it's really about entrepreneurship is about spotting opportunity and delivering value for a community that could be a for-profit could be a non-profit but it's delivering value for other people Absolutely. Uh, and that's the mindset that I want uh, to try to cultivate in and reward in young people. Absolutely. Because we're seeing more of our students who are very socially aware, socially conscious of things that are going on in the broad economic demand. And I'm seeing more of Generation Alpha and Generation Z students um, really looking at realms of how they can, can challenge the traditional norms, uh, whether it be or within the economy, um, they're going to change the world and we have to prepare them to change the world and through agency and developing that. That's important. So I, so I love that. And, and I just want to hit pause and acknowledge that this is super uncomfortable because everything that we just described challenges traditional learning experiences and more fundamentally traditional roles of educators. Absolutely. And so part of, if you really want to cultivate this entrepreneurial mindset and you want to invite kids into difference making, mm -hmm. what that means is they're going to take on problems that don't have answers. Right. And what that means is you're going to walk alongside young people working on these new adaptive, crazy difficult problems. And they're going to ask you, what's the answer? And you'll say, I don't know, but how might we? And that requires for us as educators, a, it's not just a new role in some respects, it's a new identity, Absolutely. right? Cause you're not, you're no longer the purveyor of content. You're a, you're a co-author, you're an advisor, you're a supporter, you're a coach for young people trying to do impossibly difficult work. And let, let's just acknowledge that we're all living through this together and trying to understand how to be with young people yeah. in this new place. And going back to the um, work that we did with the Learning 2025 um, Commission and that whole underpinning, I should say, the meta theme of co-authoring is so right and taking it. It, it made it into the into the bullseye. It, it did. Listen, Tom, I saw some of my language in there. I was like, yes. And Tom, we had some great conversations. But, you know, moving on right to the next question where I have the honor to serve as a pathway fellow for you at getting smart and you know my contributions through the blogs and the threads um it's just a micro a micro contribution to the macro contribution that uh getting smart is doing uh nationally as well as internationally but for my audience can you introduce and unwrap what getting smart does for the education space and also too tom if my audience wants to engage with getting smart how would they be able to do that yeah well, simply put, we, we try to help education leaders find and create the path forward. So all of our advocacy and advisory work is, is all about 
a, a collaborative effort to to find to create the the path forward and um you know our favorite thing to do at getting smart is to lift up the stories of ed leaders that are that are finding a way that are creating something new and it could be a learning experience could be an after school program could be a new school could be the the transformation of a uh, of an existing school, we, we really just want to lift up the work that people are doing that helps others learn and see what's possible. So if you got a story, we'd love to help tell your story. Absolutely. And Tom, you, you, uh, you and Getting Smart, uh, the work uh, that is coming out of there, your um, staff is just absolutely amazing. And Tom, it just has been an absolute pleasure to be uh, a part of that journey and to be affiliated and associated with getting smart. But Tom, as we're entering this new paradigm in education, right? I, I and one I I consider you one of the innovation architects in the country. You were doing this in the BC stage of education where um, a lot of the work that you were doing, I was like, you know, and this was in my formative stages. I'm like, man, this guy is bold to be able to do that. But what does innovation look like to equalize excellence and equity within high school verticals? Reason I want to focus on high school verticals is because um, the last blog post that I wrote, I did some initial research, Tom, and this um, this was a compelling metric, right? That stuck out to me. That uh, Edge Trust they did a research. I'm sorry, they released a, an article in 2020. And I believe it was roughly, it was, um, oh my God, was it, it was black students. And don't quote me on this. I believe it was only 8% of black students were advancing um, in rigorous courses and IB courses in high schools. And then I believe it was 21% or 21%, 15%. I, I, it, it's a, one of those three metrics, right? I don't have it in front of me, but it was so uh, sobering because less than, I believe it was less than, uh, 40%, less than 40% of black and brown students in education at that time had access, access, I want to use that word intentionally, access to rigorous and uh, rigorous courses and AB courses, AP courses, uh, whatever's being offered at high school. The reason I'm bringing this up, Tom, is that we know, right, and I highlighted this for you within the blogs, the pathways of poverty versus pathways of prosperity, right? So what recommendations or suggestions would you make to leaders that listen to this podcast regarding excellence in the context of pathway disruption for equity and innovation? Yeah, it's a, a beautiful and complicated question. Um, my, you know, you know I'll, I'll just start with work-based learning and how important I think that is um, it doesn't replace, you talked about access to rigorous courses, yes, and, mm -hmm. I think this has to be an and both, mm -hmm. and we need to create, strengthen spirals of career exploration where young people that historically haven't had the opportunity can imagine possible futures. Absolutely. And, and so, Michael, the best example that I've, seen in the country this goes back to pre-high school but um cone valley in east san diego county recently hosted a world of work summit where people around the country came and celebrated the work that they're doing from kindergarten to eighth grade their young people go through 54 immersive units where they step into a profession and they conduct a project and they meet professionals in that profession and then they uh practice that uh, set of skills, and then they reflect on what did I learn about that immersion? What did I learn about my strengths, interests, and values? So it's this this spiral of exposure and reflection where they they they, they widen their funnel of possibility while they're invited to build a pathway to the future, mm. a pathway that isn't, you know, 20 years ago, we thought about pathways as a a, a, a straight shot to get a job. And now it, it's much more of um, a link to opportunity that we co-author with young people. But I think the key is really as early as we can, creating breadth of exposure 
and reflection opportunities where we're inviting kids to say, who am I? What am I good at? What do I care about? Does this possible future feel like me? If so, can I step into that? If so, how can we, how can we build a pathway around that? So work-based learning, I think, is super important. And, and just the, the final point on this, as college aspirations have plummeted with, with Gen Z, what's increased is the importance of work experience. So today, I'm, I'm arguing that further learning after high school is, is as important, perhaps more important than ever, and the work experience that you have is more important than ever. It might be more important than the traditional education that you have. And so we have to help young people build not, not only a scaffold of increasingly rigorous coursework, but uh, scaffold them into work experiences. And then along with those work experiences, uh, social capital, a web of social connections that can help them um, identify and, and test and walk into uh, possible futures. Yeah, yeah. And Tom, thank you for bringing that up, right? Because when I, um, when I, uh, when I think about our work that we did with the Learning 2025 Network and um, this uh, polarity balance between further in education and work experience and the expansion and the exposure and a reflection of opportunities for that. You know, it goes back to our mutual friend, Dr. Bill Daggett, when he talks about Delta 2030, right? And as you were unpacking about that workplace learning, I was thinking about as a superintendent and this new pathway or this pathway that we're preparing students from a work experience or career experience, uh, career strengthening um, skills and educational skills as we know that. I, I reference back to a, a oldie but goodie, Tom, Edgar Schein, right? Edgar Schein's work around organizational leadership. And when we look at creating pathways of this magnitude, I think of two critical points that he brought up in his book that it just hit me in this profound context. One, education and even the pathway structure is what Edgar Schein calls monochronic, right? Individual individualism and and competition, but you're advocating for more of a pathway that Edgar Schein talks about, which is um, polychronic, right? And that's more of this collectivism that we're looking at collaboration in dynamic forms. So, you no, know, I appreciate that because if we're truly going to change to this work based learning, you know, leaders that are listening to this, we have to look at changing or moving from this level of monochronicity to polychronicity. And that's gonna be important, moving from individualism to uh, collectivism in this dynamic context. But last question, Tom, last question. So Tom, get I, you, you can tell I'm a big fan of getting smart, right? And my, uh, and, and you told me, Tom, to be bold, right? So I'm gonna, I, I would, yeah. I'm bold in my, my, my blogs. Some of my people, are saying, wow, that's that's a provocative title. But I was like, I got permission to be bold. But my last article that was published under Getting Smart was called Separate and Not Equal. A lot of a, a lot of the back of the hairs came up when I said that as the initial title. They're like, you sure that's good? I'm like, yes, it's okay. But separate and not equal, disrupting pathway tracks in the pandemic era, it highlights exactly what you were talking about, right? The inequities within our traditional pathways of poverty, where now we're looking at work-based learning and this level of career exploration and agency in the new pathways of prosperity. But in three words, Tom, what do you want to leave this VFE podcast episode about bold leadership and architecting pathways? There we go. There we go. Architecting for equity. That's it. Innovation for equity. Innovation for equity. And let, let me just add that we we put that, that's right on our landing page because yeah. that's what we're about. And simultaneously, let me just acknowledge that I think it's the great leadership paradox, yeah. uh, the ed leader paradox of innovation and equity because innovation by its nature introduces difference into a system. 
Absolutely. Those of us that have thought about equity as sameness, if you introduce innovation, hoping for step function improvement in old metrics or a big improvement on our, around new metrics, things that we're just beginning to value, mm -hmm. it by its nature will introduce inequity into a system. And so when we introduce innovation into a system, we want to do it with an equity mindset, which says, okay, if this works as hoped, our next job is to find the all kids solution so that everyone can experience this new plateau that we're on. And so we, we want to keep this tension between innovation and equity um, fresh for people and invite people to struggle into, into having a high bar for both. Yeah. And Tom, when you talk about innovation for or innovation, having that innovation for equity or, or innovation, having this tension with equity, I always go back to another, man, you got me pulling out all the oldies, but goody Peter Senge's work around wow. tension, right? right. Uh, for a state and desired outcome and, yeah. and, and having that, that tension for that, but innovation for equity and the step functions for improvement. You know, we can talk about Michael Tushman's work. We can talk about Clay Christensen's work. And even my work in my book that shows those step functions to leverage innovation and equity and having that tension for consistent, um, prescriptive and, and descriptive conversations and developing those questions so we can get to some of the catalytic matters in education. But Tom Van der Ark, you survived Voices for Excellence. Now, listen, Tom, my friend, I'm going to tell you this, my brother. We're going to do that in Washington. I'm going to make sure... Shorty, if you are listening to this, Mason, whoever, Marissa, please, we got to get Gladys Knight teed up for Tom's introduction. This is my walk-up song, and bring your, bring your roughly shirt, Michael, because we're... We're going to be doing it. I'm going to be doing this, Tom. Hey, Tom, if my audience want to get in touch with you, how would they be able to do that? Hey, gettingsmart.com. You can find us there. Um, I'm, I'm still on, uh, on the Twitter machine, uh, <laughs> at T Vander Ark, um, find all my school visits and, uh, and, and early morning outings on Instagram at Tom Vander Ark. And for the vegans in the crowd, epic.veg, check out my Instagram for, uh, for all things vegan and veg, epic.veg, do it. Oh, oh, please, my audience, do it because Tom Vander Ark is uh, one of the brilliant minds in education. It is absolute. It is it is an absolute honor, Tom, to have you on Voices for Excellence. I look forward to talking with you soon, my friend, and I can't wait to uh, have the convene. I know it's in the fall, but October will be here sooner than later. But I hope to see you before that, my friend. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely. And onward and upward, everybody. Have a great evening.